I'm going to talk. Um, oh, sorry. The, the point I was going to make is that, um, well, despite the different background and perspective, I think what's interesting uh, is that some of these ideas are starting to converge and now already introduced that key concept of ad, adjunction or adjoint relationship. And I'm going to expand upon that concept in, in this talk. But from a slightly different, not from a psycho, not so much from a psychophysics perspective, but from uh, something uh, more of a uh, cognitive science perspective. So there's really there's a couple of key words in this title, um, as you can. <clears throat> and the first one here is the, um, a, a dual, some kind of duality. Okay, I mean the the point that we're interested in is the relationship between the mental and the physical. Uh, in particular, the, the na nature of consciousness, and you know the concept of duality, of course, is not new. But the key per, uh, interest here, or from my perspective, is this notion of universal duality, and how this relates to uh, category theory. <clears throat> and so, and as I said before, I'm coming from perspective of cognitive science, but I think these ideas, uh, as uh, now and Hayato and I have been. Uh, getting to know each other better on, the, on this, on this uh, issue, I think they're starting to converge on some, something quite interesting. So, and so uh, from a cognitive science perspective, we can ask, there are three. So one of the first questions is, okay, we are, I'm going to talk about a particular theoretical perspective called category theory um, that now I mentioned. Uh, it's, very, it's a branch of mathematics that's, that's become uh, increasingly popular in recent years. And it, and uh, in fact, just last night, we had a very nice event and Hato Sagasan here uh, introduced his new book, uh, Cognitive Science Horizons. So my, well, despite the, a lot of technical detail that you might see in this slide, I recommend reading Hato's book for a very nice conceptual perspective uh, on, on um, category theory. One of the problems with using theory, and particularly uh, uh, abstract mathematical theory, is how to bridge the gap between the more informal concepts that you're familiar with in psychology with the more formal concepts that are used in mathematics. And I think uh, category theory has a lot of potential in this regard. <clears throat> so, but, but for this talk, I, I'll try to keep it as conceptual as possible. Anyhow, the, the, the problem is that in uh, category, th category theory is in fact a, quite a vast area of mathematics. And so it, it's one thing to say, okay, let's try, let's use category theory, but it, it's, it's another thing to know how to use it. Uh, and there are many ways you, uh, category theory is used, uh, depending on the person's uh, objectives and their uh, personal background. Uh, so, in, in, and for our purposes, or for my purposes in particular, uh, we're coming from a cognitive science perspective. So, one way to reframe uh, uh, your thinking about if you're interested in, in category theory is three basic questions that cognitive scientists are generally familiar with. Uh, what makes cognitive science a science that distinguishes itself from other sciences? Uh, this, this actually, I'm following um, Robert Wilson in his introduction to uh, the Encyclopedia of MI, uh, the MIT Encyclopedia of Cognitive Sciences, but I really like it. It's really quite a nice way to frame uh, a particular viewpoint, and that is um, <clears throat> in reverse order. You should, I guess you're, everyone's at least tacitly familiar with these these points, and but I'll just say them in here. What makes uh, a genuinely mental science possible? And this is this uh, notion of computation, uh, representationalism. Now, <clears throat> when I say answers, uh, he means answers in a sort of a general sense. Of course, there are many versions of representationalism and, and so on. Uh, but for the, for the current purposes, I'm just going to uh, use this as a framework. Uh, and the classical notion of that is some sort of mapping between states of the world and some internal met mental state or some other uh, internal mental state and, uh, and other... Uh, our mental states. Okay, so that's fairly standard. Uh, from a category now, why, the reason why I'm doing this is that how we can get a, a handle on the category theory perspective. As I said before, it's a very abstract uh, branch of mathematics. It's not at all clear when you when you open an introduction to um, uh, category theory. Yeah, you know, it's just exactly how this could possibly relate to cognitive science. And for many years, I I struggled with the same same sort of question, but. Um, there is some sort of nice correspondence that we can work with as a, as a sort of a starting point. And so uh, now I already mentioned the three basic concepts of the three fundamental concepts of category theory, functor, oh, sorry, category itself, functor and natural transformations, which I'll briefly go through. But for an intuition on what this means, well, you can think of the notion of mapping between uh, a representation as, a, as a, an example of a, a functor. Okay. 
The second question then is, uh, how can psychology avoid the homunculus problem? This is a classic problem in cognitive science. Perhaps it's not so classic in psychophysics because, you know, you, um, you have a different perspective on what you want to do. But nonetheless, uh, if, if we, if we uh, start with a notion of representation, then we have to have something that interprets those representations. And this leads to the so-called infinite regress. Hence, the homunculus is that little man in the, in the head that does the interpretation. And, and therefore, what, what, what uh, does the interpretation for that little man? Well, then there's another little man. And so you have this infinite regress. And computationalism is a general answer to this question because you have what's called um, the system, uh, the infinite regress terminates on, on these so-called terminal symbols, things that get in, are essentially interpreted as themselves. Uh, it's a very it's a very nice way. Of course, there are very, very, many variations of uh, computationalism as well. Uh, now, the, the, category, the category theory analog of this, it, we can talk about is uh, natural transformations. And the reason for that will become clear in the next few slides. But the, the ultimate question that we really want to know, of course, is what is the relationship between the mental and the physical? The standard answer to that is functionalism. I'm not going to talk about any of these in detail. You're already probably familiar with it. And Cartesian duality is, a, is a sort of the classic answer to this. Each of these positions, of course, has, has, um, um, is still you know, strongly debated. But the point here I want to make is that, well, um, there is a category theory notion of this, of duality, which is the notion of adjointness or adjoint functor as now already introduced. And I'm going to talk about a bit more in more detail. But the key point for um, today is, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the sort of take home message or the slogan I'm going to uh, talk about today is this um, analogy that internal is to external as subjective is to objective. Okay, it's pretty simple. Basic idea is that, of course, that you, your subjective experience is internal and how somehow we're as both as uh, uh, researchers and investigators and when we're co uh, communicating with other people, uh, there is an, a, an external aspect to this. And I'm going to say that that relationship is somewhat analogous. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, a little bit, little bit more detail. One way of thinking about categories. Uh, okay, or, or just recall there are three basic concepts: category, functor, and natural transformation. I guess most people in this room are not really, really familiar with this idea. But the one way to get a handle on this is to talk about it in terms of systems theory. Where category can be thought of as just a general, what's called an automata. You know, you have state, and and they get each state. Get, you're in some particular state, and then something happens, and you move to another particular state. It's very basic. And categories are generally can be thought of as, as that kind of system. But we want more than just automata. We don't regard automata themselves as having necessarily conscious in any sense. Uh, so I mentioned the three, the three things before, represent, representationalism, computationalism. Well, we don't want just any sort of state state machine. We want something that's representing something. So a sort of standard way of thinking about this is like um, a, a clock, for example, is a kind of representational system. But we, we and, and so... Um, well, I said before that mappings correspond to functors, and so this is where the functors would come. This corresponds to some notion of functor. And then finally, uh, not finally, but the, the next step then is uh, we don't just want, we don't regard clocks as, uh, as really doing anything other than representing what the temperature, uh, what the time is, for example. And we need something, another step, and that's this uh, notion of comp uh, computationalism, computers. And the, the relationship between representationalism and computationalism is that computers are uh, manipulating re uh, representational states. And representational states are not just any states, but they are states that stand in place for something else. So there's this sort of hierarchy. Or, or... Now, ultimately, um, we don't also we don't regard computers as consciousness, or at least I don't in any sense. So there's an additional step here that we need. And I've just, I've just labeled it intentional and for better or for worse. But let's just say that we, we, we're looking at not just computational systems generally, but something uh, a bit more specific that something that has some sort of mental, uh, uh, me uh, sort of mental, mental world about it. And this is where the notion of adjoint comes in. Okay, so let's just, um, this slide here is just meant to give you a bit of bit better understanding of what I mean by what's meant by functor. Um, uh, sorry, cat category functor, a natural transformation. And, the, and very, very basically, um, our, it's just to say that okay, if you have a, a category, it's just this collection of, remember I said the category could correspond to a, like an automata. So you can think of these dots as states and these arrows as transformations between these states. And so this whole thing here would constitute you know, some category. And we may, we may label that category uh, A, for example. 
Now, the, po the point of this uh, slide actually is not to teach you about category theory, but to get at this notion of the relationship between the internal and external. So, you know, the relationship between subjective and objective, internal and external, implicit, explicit, and so on and so forth. It, it's, it often comes, and structure in this, in the notion of structure itself, often comes up time and time again in uh, cognitive science, but in a very informal way. So it's not always clear exactly what people mean by this. And what, one of the very, very nice things about category theory is to really pin, pin down formally what, what, what you could possibly mean by that. And once you've done that, then we can have a serious discussion about whether or not that, that, that particular um, interpretation is meaningful. The real problem in cognitive science and psychology generally, and the reason why it, in, in theoretical terms, it often goes round and round circles is people don't, are not really explicit enough about what they mean. They sort of mean it in a, hand, in a sort of a hand wave in uh, informal sense. And often discussions never get progress, very, uh, debates never progress very far because you know the, what they mean by that you know, often changes and can not, not be pinned down. The very nice thing about category theory is we can pin this down in a particular way. And so we have this, we have this thing called a category and the, and the functor then is just the, now, so I said a category is like a, uh, some sort of state machine. And then of course the functor then, we have this functor, let's say F, and what it's doing is, as now I mentioned, but I'm just going to reiterate here, what it does is, is it sends these objects and arrows in this one category uh, in, uh, to map them. And of course, the crucial point here is not just any mapping, it's a sort of a structurally consistent mapping. And you can do that one way. And so we uh, said uh, functors correspond to some notion of mapping or representation. So these these objects, these A, B, and T on the left-hand side can be thought of as representations of the original states uh, and the, in the original category. And now we're, the, the point here is that now we're working in this new category, uh, B. Now we can, we can have more than one mapping, of course. And then if we have another one here, we have another functor G, and then this will get mapped into something else. Now, what, what, what we see here, well, now we have two representations, uh, the A, C, T representing those internal states, uh, the 0, 1, 2, maybe it's a counter, for example, represent, representing those states. So we have two functors. And importantly, if there is a correspondence between these two representations, if those two represents that representations cohere in some way, are consistent, uh, then we can have these mappings between uh, the, the two uh, representations. And that's these mappings constitute uh, the natural transformation. Okay. <clears throat> as now mentioned. And so this, this is how we get at the notion I mentioned before that um, we have this notion of uh, representation, computation. Well, the natural transformation is a mapping. We're interpreting these uh, images of the these functors as representations. So therefore, naturally, the natural transformation corresponds to some computation over those uh, re uh, representational states. And that's what we mean in cognitive science by uh, uh, computation over representational states. Okay, so that's one view. That's sort of the internal view of what's going on. So we have these two categories, A, B, and these two functors, F, G, and then this natural transformation between the two. We can also look at this perspective here, and A here just stands for this particular category, B stands for this. Now, the point I want to get to here is that we have both, we, already we have this notion, a, a formalized notion of the relationship between internal and external. For example, the, the category A, for example, has these objects and elements that are inside uh, this category here. So A is now this thing here. But the functors, so there's a lot of arrows going here, but the, all the arrows have different state statuses. Okay. So this functor here, uh, this F, where is it here, is actually an arrow between two categories. So the, while these arrows are internal to A, uh, this arrow, this functor here is external to A. Okay. And then we had these, uh, these, these other arrows, these natural transformations. Well, the, the natural transformation is, is, uh, can either be thought as a single arrow between, but notice that the natural the, all the arrows in the natural transformation are within uh, the category B. Okay, so this is, so we, ha we have this notion of uh, internal arrow to A, external arrow to A and B, and then back to the, the notion of natural transformation as a, as a bunch of internal arrows in A. Okay, and so already we have this uh, very formalized uh, conception of the relationship between internal and external. And from that very simple thing, uh, we can, turns out that we can actually do, uh, category theorists have worked out that there's a lot that you can actually do uh, with this um, arrangement. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, th now, category, I said category functor and natural transformation sort of, the, the starting point, but what we re well, what we really want to do is talk about this notion of universal. Uh, in, in the title, I said it, the key word was duality, but not just any kind of duality. The notion of universal duality, and in and what makes <clears throat> if you open a, an introductory book to category theory, you'll 
the standard way to introduce it is, is of course, with um, with the concepts of uh, category uh, functor and natural transformation, as we see here. But what, where it gets confusing for most people is that when you get beyond that, you get down to this this notion of universal construction. Okay, so if you if if you open a book like and different authors prefer to introduce these notions of universal construction in different ways depending on their what they're, what they're targeting. And so, for example, if you were to look at if you open McLean's um, uh, seminal book on a math, um, category theory for math um, for the working mathematician, you'll probably see an introduction that starts with category. Uh, with category over here, uh, go to functor, of course, and natural transfer. It's, it's a sort of a natural progression of, of introducing the concepts. But then when you get down, when you want to introduce the concept of um, universal morph, uh, sorry, un universal construction, you might start off with talking about what's called the universal arrow, and then you might move from that side, uh, make your way across to talk about represent fun representable functor and so on and so forth. And eventually you get all the way you know, uh, by the you know, almost the end of the book, you'll get to some, the concept of of adjoint. Okay. <clears throat> Alternatively, if you look, if you read a book like from say Tom Linster's uh, basic category theory, you might get a, a different kind of view. You you get the, the introduction of category functor and natural transformation, but he get, he dives straight into the concept of of adjoint, and then work, works his way back to these other concepts like limit, representative functor, and so forth. Now, all these bidirectional arrows are intended to say that they're not the same concept, but um, there are different views or, of uh, some, this notion of universality, which category theory is, which is central to category theory or ordinary category theory, at least. Uh, and it's, these are very, very important because when you talk about structure, um, there are two ways to talk about it. You, you can talk about it. There is, there exists like a more mathemat pure mathematician might talk about structure as a particular relationship between states. But a computer scientist would also want to talk about, well, how did you compute that structure? And so these, um, what's what's really neat about category theory is you can often talk about a particular structure in a particular form, uh, but then you can talk about how to compute that. How, where did you get that structure in the first place? So for example, adjoints, uh, 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 something that I'll talk about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm moving towards in this talk uh, is, is this notion of uh, computing the adjoint via its, what's called its end. Now the particular details are not important for, for today's talk, but I just want to give you a sort of an overview so that you don't get, you don't feel completely lost when people start to talk about these category theory terms. Okay, so that's the sort of basic introduction. Now we get, go on, we want to get back to this idea of the relationship between subjective and objective for the purposes of the project and, and, and consciousness, uh, understanding the nature of consci consciousness generally. <clears throat> and so uh, one way to do this um, is I'm going to take the um, Tom Linster's perspective and dive straight into the notion of uh, of Notice also of adjoint relationship. And I'm going to do it this way, and what seems to be a rather natural way of doing it. Um, notice also that I'm taking a, slight, a different perspective on on my my approach is a more of a uh, from cognitive science towards consciousness rather than say a Tottoni approach where you say we take consciousness as sort of axiomatic or fundamental and you work you work your way back up. But I think these uh, what makes what makes this all interesting is these two com these complementary approaches approaches can converge on something quite nice anyhow so a natural a, a sort of a, a sort of a straightforward way to um uh introduce the notion of uh, adjoint is to just think of uh two people alice and bob one of them is subject one of them is an object um and for example in an experimental setting you might have for example alice might be the experimenter and bob is the subject and that's the way i've set it up here and the arrangement now it, it's 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 simple of course it's sort of natural to say okay there's this bi-directional relationship alice um presents stimuli to bob and bob you know, does something with those stimuli and, and then alice uh, gets feedback so <clears throat> now what's crucial so that that, that in itself is not, nothing particularly new but what makes uh category theory interesting is this notion and of of just how these 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 two people uh, interact I just want to back up a little bit and go back to now's a, a point in his talk. Um, in let's say in the philosophy or, or, or in, sorry, in the people who are interested in consciousness, is there, there are two sort of diametrically opposed approaches. Either either consciousness is just completely unknowable, uh, and it's sort of pointless to talk about any sort of theoretical um, uh, perspective on it, or it's completely knowable, and you know, sure you can go ahead. What? Um, and so what's common in, in cognitive science to talk about isomorphism between you know, the state of Alice and the state of Bob, 
But it turns out <clears throat> for reasons that, um, well, it just turns out that the notion of isomorphism is often too strong a notion. And even in cognitive science, it's too strong. And so what cognitive scientists tend to do is just ha hack away the bits that they don't want uh, and just say, okay, it's sort of this, pa this partial isomorphism. It's a bit of a hacky way of doing things. Uh, a much better notion, a much more interesting notion is the notion of adjoint, which is uh, as now introduced, is this notion where the, the objects, the states of, the, of Alice and the states of Bob don't have to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. But what, what is uh, crucial or what is it, what does make the whole thing very interesting is that there, the relations between uh, the Bob and uh, Bob's internal relations, like this one here, and Alice's internal relations, this one here, are themselves uh, in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Even though the, the states here, uh, this state here maps to here, but this, uh, there's no, <clears throat> the, um, there need not be a bidirectional relationship between the, these states. And that's what the, this diagram is showing. And that's why the, there's a lot of subtlety in uh, category theory and how to do this and why these arrows are, are the way they are. I'll just briefly go through this so that you get a feel for what's going on. See that we have these arrows. See, we have this arrow from here to here. Now this arrow is actually part of the function. This is, so what you can think of this is Alice uh, is setting the experimental uh, context uh, for Bob. Uh, Bob is thinking about these uh, the state. Of what what is these cues, for example, makes a response, and then uh, uh, that response gets communicated back to Alice. Now the point is that these these dotted arrows and these solid arrows are actually uh, in two different um, domains. One is ex the dotted arrows are external to the, the two people, and the solid arrows are internal. And against this notion of internal external relationship. And so on. And a good way to get a good way to get intuition for this is if you're familiar with the classic, um, what's called progressive matrices uh, experiments or Raven's progressive matrices, which are used commonly used in IQ tests. Um, what you typically do in such a test is you give a, a, a matrix a matrix of stimuli, and with one of the cells empty, and the, the subject has supposed is supposed to uh, pick a a choice. Uh, stimulus that fills that cell in an appropriate way. And the obvious one, and this is pretty obvious, but they can be quite difficult. The idea here is that the, of course, the experimenter doesn't tell explicitly what the relationships between these stimuli are, but but by the power of analogical thinking and reasoning and human ability, generally, uh, they can induce uh, the fact that um, it should be the solid square right here. And so this relationship here uh, is, is kind of a completion task What's interesting is that we can make this formally uh, precise uh, in a way that I won't describe, but I'll just put it up there. Uh, this notion of um, uh, this relationship between Alice and Bob can be formalized as a kind of adjoint relationship between uh, uh, the, uh, Alice and Bob at model as categories and these, these adjoint, these functors, these mappings uh, are called adjoint functors. And this is a left adjoint, this is a right adjoint. And this, all this, if you go from here to here to the sort of informal slightly more formalized situation from a, an informal concept to the experimental setting. You can actually form, mo formally model this via this kind of uh, category theory arrangement, which in itself is a general, is an instance of a more general um, situation called the adjoint situation. So the F and the G are called adjoint functors uh, and they relate this in uh, uh, these two categories, in this case, Alice and Bob uh, in a very nice way. And uh, it turns out that this, this general concept of adjoint or adjunction is very important in mathematics and it pops up also in computer science. And for my work, it, it turns out to be very important too. And as now already talked about, it seems to be a nice way to talk about the um, subjective uh, uh, objective relation, or, uh, sorry, the, the relationship between um, qualia and reports. So that's the general connection uh, between um, the qualia and the uh, formal category theory that I'm going to talk, that I'm talking about, espousing uh, today. Okay, so there is there are many technical details, um, and I'm not going to go through this. But all I want to just show is just that now the the, the key the important point here is that um, with the adjoint relationship, when you go from uh, one side to the other and back again. The important point here is that when you go from one side uh, to the other, say from the uh, from A, A is Alice, go to B, uh, uh, Alice is setting uh, with this functor called F, and you go back again. The important point is that 
you don't go right back to where you started from. There's always this gap uh, between the um, between where you started from and where you ended up. <clears throat> and so uh, there is a but the but this gap is systematically related by this uh, natural transformation situation here. And so <clears throat> and also so we have even though we have some error, we have systematic error that we can uh, model. In, in, is a way to think about this. We also have it on the other side as well with Bob, uh, and and in fact, um, both Alice and Bob, uh, both when they are coordinating, are uh, working together, they uh, they uh, interact in a way that is uh, natural in this sense, in this uh, formal sense. But and so, uh, and this is just another. Now that was a sort of a. Uh, conceptual example that I gave you. You can actually do this uh, for real uh, psycholo uh, experiment, um, psychological experiments. Uh, this is um, a uh, paradigm des designed by Graham Halford and his colleagues uh, a while ago. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Again, you can see it's a kind of completion task. And the, the point in this particular uh, example is that despite all the uh, uh, the differences between the two tasks, I showed you a matrix completion task before, and this is called a relational schema induction task. It's a kind of induction task where you give subjects uh, um, mappings of a particular type where the stimuli have no particular meaning and they learn the task. It's, it's also, it's, it's a very classic study. Uh, the original is called learning to learn or learning set theory uh, in the classic animal and comparative psychology literature. Uh, Graham Halford and, and colleagues uh, extended this in, for uh, cognitive psychology in humans. Uh, and what they do is if you get, when, when they learn one task and you change all the stimuli and they learn another task, gradually or very quickly, actually, within two or three, um, uh, le learning two or three task instances of this type, they learn the underlying structure. Uh, and, and importantly, uh, this sort of situation uh, corresponds to an adjoint situation, which I won't go into detail. There are many technical details to explain this, but the, the point is that this adjoint situation crops up in many different, it crops up in many places in mathematics, and that's why it's so useful in mathematics and in computer science. But more and more, we're starting to see that it can be crop up in cognitive science and, and, and as now mentioned, uh, work that we're doing now, uh, Hayata and myself on this, using this kind of concept, this concept of adjoint relationship, uh, to get a handle on the relationship between uh, qualia and uh, behavioral reports. And it's an extremely beautiful piece of mathematics. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't, <laughs> I can talk forever for about it, but I guess you wouldn't want me to do that. Um, there, there, I had a few more slides, but I only have one, really one more slide. I was going to talk, you can really, that, that's just really the basics, but you can really go to town on this and talk about um, a more um, advanced concepts like the notion of profunctor. Uh, I suspect that uh, if Oizumi san was here, he was talking about, and um, Michael Kosan already mentioned about the relationship between qualia and behavior. There's a really, really beautiful theory about how to develop this uh, and ha ha does ha indeed have connections uh, to um, optical transport theory that Oizumi san mentioned before. Uh, the, really, the person who did do all this work is Simon Wilton, and it's just extraordinary. It's just an extraordinary connection that you get from this very, very abstract uh, mathematics to connections that are, are very familiar in sort of, say, signal processing like the Legeron uh, functional transform just come out of special cases of this sort of arrangement. Uh, to, I've also used it you know, for some of the stuff that I want, but I'm not going to talk about this. So I'll just get to my final slide then, the, uh, the discussion slash summary. Of course, what, what we really want to know is the relationship between the objective and, sorry, the subjective and objective. What is that relationship? Well, I'm saying it's some kind of duality uh, of course, that's familiar in, in philosophy and, and you know, the notion of Cartesian duality, um, but I'm, I'm using it in a different sense uh, in that uh, it's an adjoint situation in a very technical uh, category theory sense. Um, <clears throat> what that means, uh, uh, there's also another sense of duality. It's closely related. I, uh, if you notice in the natural transformation, there's a square of arrows. Okay. And so what not only are we going from left to right, but we're also allowing it, the square of ours uh, allows us to do comparison. And comparison is very, very important uh, whenever you're doing some sort of uh, cognitive psychological task like the one I mentioned, uh, uh, rather than say, maybe perhaps less, uh, well, I won't say any more about that. Anyhow, what that means is that there are two routes to go to, to from A to B, uh, and you can exploit that. And, and the idea is that humans also exploit that when they have this, this notion of type one, type two system, a very intuitive uh, uh, feel for the way that they think about the world and more analytic way of it. And, and uh, category theory sort of captures this relationship very formally. 
Uh, and then the what is the adjoint system uh, adjoint situation? Well, it's technically uh, what's called the universe, uh, universal construction. And the right or left adjoint, that given one of the functors, the other functor is is can be uniquely determined. It's kind of what that means is it's the best that you can do. How to do that? Well, there's a whole lot more, a whole lot of other theory to go in. What's called the n cohen calculus, uh, developed by Luigi in, in a very very nice uh, way. It's extremely technical, but and I won't go into it. But the point is that. Um, the end is the way that you can extract. Uh, so what's sort of an intuitive idea of what's going on is you, know, you have this subjective experience. You project that subjective experience by communication, for example, or some sort of behavior to another person. That other person then has to uh, reconstruct uh, that what their subjective state is. And the, the end, it's a, a category theory term, uh, is one way of doing this, a very nice way of doing this. So I will end on that. That's the end of this talk. <laughs> A very fundamental question, but um, so okay. So um, in my, if I understand correctly, um, the putting the external arrows, um, which is functor, is a nat natural transform. Is it correct? Yeah, and um, what makes it natural? Um, how how can we say this is a natural transform? Is there any um, particular way to yeah, say all, it's natural? All very good questions. And the answers are yeah. But the basic answer is yes. Um, oh. Well, to your last question, the, uh, to your first, the first part of your question, uh, maybe I need to just um, point out that the functor and the natural transformation. Uh, another way of thinking about it, and the way they do it, think about it in high category theory, is think of the categories as sort of a zero, a point. Huh. A functor is a line between two points, yeah. and a natural transformation is a, as a line between two lines, like a sheet. Line so there's a zero points. dimensional. The categories uh -huh. have a zero dimensional thing. Uh -huh. Functors are one dimensional. And, okay. Uh -huh. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the thick one is trying. Um, natural transformation. That's right, and uh, that's functa. Yes. The name of name of the arrow is functa. Yes. Okay. And there's some there's a lot of subtlety with this as well. In that, um, maybe yeah. But going to this diagram here, so this this sort of external view gives you the idea that yeah, mm. of, um, categories are like points, mm. but they're points with some, some addition. It's a bit like in physics. You know, say the original concept of atom was you know, indivisible. In fact, of course, atoms we now know have lots of structure inside it. Mm -hmm. A bit similar to category. You, you basically pick your baseline. Mm. Uh, that's what the category is. You, you, where I'm saying it's a point, but actually it has in, a lot of internal structure. Oh. So one of the things that tricks people up in category theory uh, is because they it's not that and there's no absolute level. Mm. What makes category theory precise and extremely beautiful. Mm -hmm. is that the relationship between the levels is very precisely defined, mm -hmm. which is not done in any, anywhere else. Even for computer scientists, they can often mess with your head because they don't really, but it's, it's really, and it's a bit like in psychology where you set a baseline, okay? Mm -hmm. There's no a priori universal baseline. Okay, if you set it too right. low, it just makes all the data meaningless and everything's the same. If you set it too high, you get nothing. Right. So you know, where you set your baseline, what you might call as a category, really depends what sort of questions you're trying mm -hmm. to answer. Mm -hmm. okay. But once you've done that, um, mm -hmm. the point I, I, I'll just re re reiterate the earlier point to your first question, and that is that the although that I said that the uh, the the um, although I said this is uh, zero. Le I'm sorry. <laughs> although I said this is like level zero. Confused. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Although I said this, uh, this is level zero, uh, this is level one, and this is level two. It's a much more uh, subtle but important. It's not just any sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not just like matrix where you have, say one, uh, you know, one, you have you know one column and a, a square and then a, a cube. It's that the relationship between these arrows is very subtly. It's extraordinary. Exquisite, the way that you get this generality, but specificity that gives you so many results that no other theory comes even close to doing what category oh. theory does. In my view. <laughs> it's an it's extraordinary piece of subtlety that, 
And uh, of course, you should read uh, yeah. uh, Hato's book, but I also would like to right. plug my, my recent paper where I went to great lengths to describe this for people who are not, mm -hmm. the, to bring out this. Often, often when you look at category theory, you, you, if you open a book like McLean, or not even McLean, but anyway, you just get a, a, a sea of definitions, examples, and propositions and, th and theorems. Mm -hmm. But really, if you look at behind all that, there is a consistent pattern in the way that they develop their concepts. And it's just mm -hmm. extraordinary. <laughs> you know, mm. if you're a computer scientist, what you, you do the stupid thing and just make it so general <laughs> that it has to be useless. Mm -hmm. And as McLean said, uh, McLean is, has a just a, a suite of beautiful quotes. And we don't make, we don't seek to make the most general generalizations, but the right generalization. And of course, right is contextual to the kinds of questions that you want to answer. And so, to, to wrap up that particular answer, um, notice that there are a whole bunch of arrows here, but the this arrow here is internal mm. to A, mm. but this arrow here, just to reiterate what I said before, is external. Yeah. But these arrows here, now here, here it's, we seem to do a backflip. You, I said that natural transformation is, is level two. So you think, or you, you might think, oh, well, maybe the functors are internal to the natural transformation because it's zero, one, two order. But in fact, the natural, because you, you think, okay, I call it, I call it the, the, uh, the structure a zero, a point a line and a sheet. And so you might think, okay, once I got to natural transformation, maybe I'm maybe the, they're composed of func functors. But in actual fact, they're not. If you look at, closely at the definition, you'll see that they're actually composed of these little arrows over here. But these little arrows are actually internal to the category B. That's why this double arrow is doing two things. It's working at a higher level, oh, oh, oh. but it's actually working inside this category here. And that's where the exquisiteness of category theory, theory comes about, because I said that I'm, I'm trying to get at this point of the relationship between internal and external. And so we, we, we say, OK, we start over here. And we went internal from you know, the, the arrows internal to the category. And then we went over here to external to the, the notion, this notion of functor. But actually, now we're going back into this notion of internal because the, the arrows in the natural transformation are internal to that category. Uh -huh. And so this might make your head spin. But actually, when you look at the, the theory, the, the, what's extraordinary about the theory is it, it doesn't, it, you know, for anyone else, you'd say, oh, this is, this is nonsense. You're just going around and around in circles. But in fact, the context is changing. And it's not, and this is what makes it, a, adjoint relationships so interesting, is that when you go in the adjoint relationship, say, in fact, we are actually talking about a functor, uh, uh, an adjoint functor. What we're doing is we're starting here and we're going across here, but we're not coming back to the start again. We're coming back somewhere differently. Mm -hmm. And this is the gap. And this is the point about the relationship between qualia and reports. Mm -hmm. It may be that there is always, qualia is always has some private part to it mm -hmm. that we can never get exactly the qualia. And this is the point that now I was alluding to earlier. And that our behavior, the best that we can do, and even the subject themselves, the best that the subject can do, you might think, oh, I'm the best person to know my subjective state. But that may not be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. That itself may be an adjoint relationship. And to answer a question that Haito asked me many, many years ago when um, Makiko uh, um, um, organized the uh, quantum thing, you know, where, where are these sort of adjoint things are propping up? Well, a natural, a natural way to think about this on a, from a neuroscience point of view, <laughs> that's a pretty useless brain, but um, let's say that's your brain. Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> So that's a, that's the prefrontal cortex here, and that's its parietal. We, we know, of course, from MRI studies that whenever you do any sort of reasonably difficult task, both parietal and, and uh, prefrontal activate. But you can, a natural way of thinking about this is as an adjoint situation, you know. Um, or, for example, if, for example, uh, as Mike Ma already pointed out, if we know the site of where the qualia is, maybe not parietal, but somewhere else, uh, and what we're, what the people are doing is that they're accessing some other part of the brain to look back at themselves, but they're not getting right back at to where they, where they were. They're getting at that, at this sort of adjoint relationship. But the crucial point is that this adjoint relationship, it's not just you get back anywhere. You get What you get back is a, a natural transformation. It's a systematic relationship, and that's crucial. And that's why so much of category three works out. And that's why it's just an incredible, it's just genius, actually. <laughs> Collective genius. <laughs> And there's no better way to put it. <laughs> wow. Maybe, maybe I, I want to just uh, point out one one of the most important kind of a summary that uh, Steve said. Mm -hmm. So 
if you think about any kind of you know abstract theory to go from let's say external to you know behavior to subject or something like that and then you go from really bottom up kind of you know thinking like even from atom to you know molecule to something like that protein or whatever you usually go from go you know really bottom to up and up and up and just going like you know abstract or coarse or noisy or whatever right usually but what category theory is is that you know at the bottom there's a category and there's some arrow here and then you go up in this you know, functor level and then now you talk about further abstracting of natural transformation. And it took me many years for me to realize this, but the real, real thing about natural transformation is a collection of uh, these arrows in the target domain of the category. So starting from something like atom and the bundle of atom now gets a lot of atoms. In a sense, it's like you know recursive, but it, it kind of closes here. Concrete, abstract, ten concrete, and that's the sort of what uh, you know Steve was talking about, starting from internal, and then to describe it as an external once, but then the next level comes back as a bunch of internal. So it's not like you know standard kind of you know yeah. going up and up and up and. Mm. Third level is now actually the first level, oh. but a bunch of first level. Bunch of first level. Yeah, a bunch of arrows. It's actually a very nice point because <laughs> the experiment that I talked about, what now saying is what's called a psychic three group. And when you do say addition modulo, say three, for example, you go zero plus one is one, uh, one plus one is two, two and then two plus one, you say three, but it's modulo three. So you go back to zero again. And so we have zero, one, two, but the natural transformation is pointing back to, and so this is kind of, but it's not, it's not so simple as just a cycle. You know, there's, this, there's this difference here, but, uh, and, but so, yeah. Well, at least I understand uh, Katuwur's cell is um, amu amusing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I may look at, um, Go go for reading the book. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> any, any other comments or questions? We can step up the time. Uh, as you point out, uh, universal construction has many a kind of equivalent um, representation and uh, you can choose mm -hmm. the arbitrary route mm -hmm. to approach. The, my question is, what do you think the best way, the, the best way means as a, from the cognitive scientific viewpoint, what is the really fundamental starting point of the formulation? Ah, uh, okay. So going back to that, uh, let me just write, let me just bring back the, uh, slide this slide here yeah, yeah. um yeah very good question um my <laughs> actually very very good question because my perspective changes <laughs> so traditionally um yeah thank actually thanks for that question because that uh, allows me to say some more <laughs> which is always a danger <laughs> um did i get that oh sorry Yeah, so um, the way I had originally been thinking of it as the, I think I've got that in here. Um, generally speaking, you have to start with category functor and natural transformation um, because but that's just the way the world is. Now, uh, traditionally, I was I went this, this route as being pretty fundamental. And the reason for that, and my thinking for a long time until very recently, until I reread um, Tom Linster's book and prepared for this talk, actually, um, <clears throat> is to go uh, in this other direction. Uh, maybe I can even use another color. Now, I want to, I don't want to say at this stage, I have two minds. 
and one of the reasons for that is what one reason for going uh, on the right hand, so the red arrow first, is that. Um, Sorry, my slowness on this. Should be, I wonder is, is the uh, universal arrow is really a, a sort of a mapping. It's, it doesn't matter um, what these mean particularly, but you can think of the universal arrow is sort of um, universality in one direction. Okay, just say from a functor to object. And you can think of the um, adjoint as universality in two directions because you've got the, the functor going in the other way. Okay. Actually, I should. I got the symbols back from it, but it doesn't matter. And so I was thinking that originally I was thinking, okay, it's, it's natural to start at one at universality in one direction, so the optimality in one direction, and then build up to the second. But then on rereading uh, Tom Linson's book, uh, you can go the other. You can start with uh, another perspective: is to say that well, I, I mentioned before that um, what's re what's really extraordinary actually is you don't really need much. So sometimes you, what you try to do, particularly in mathematics and in computer science too, is you try to reduce the number of assumptions as much as possible. And going the, the right-hand route, you, you sort of you got to build up with the universal error, and then you got to keep going that way. Whereas <laughs> extraordinarily, if you go the, the Tom Linth route, in fact, McLean also does this as well. You only really need three things. <laughs> you know, the 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 two the two mappings, the two opposing mappings. Which is natural, but you do need functoriality. That's crucial. But functoriality is not really such a, a strong axiom, I, I think. Although you, you you might say that you, you have something weaker than functoriality, but the system evolves or develops into that in that situation. But then you, you also you need this bidirectionality between the this sort of local bidirectionality that that um, um, and now talked about. And once you got that, <laughs> it's just extraordinary that um, just these little three things here. Uh, not only do they give you adjoints, but they give you everything else. <laughs> you go back in the other direction. So uh, I'm kind of moving to the other side now because I, just, I like the fact that you minimize. And in more, even more extraordinary, I'm, I can't talk about it here because I'm still working on it. But you can go even, you can go even if, you, if you know things about what's called Khan extensions, <laughs> right. one adds, you can go even more fundamental than that. And it's, it's just, you get to a point where you start to see the light after decades of being in the dark. <laughs> It's, it's just a, I, it's just a shame I can't, <laughs> can't share with you. It's the kind of thing that you really have to experience uh, yourself. That's why I recommend everyone <laughs> at least read <laughs> I the book and, and then pick up a yeah. like Tom Linster's or, or some other introduction to category three. It's, you might ask, it's, it's common practice, of course, to, and, and the big thing now, of course, and a very nice thing about this project is it's very interdisciplinary and it's very uh, collaborative, but there's nothing, nothing beats first-hand experience and uh, I, I don't know and no I've talked about this before and I wanted to say this actually last night and I, I, I chose the wrong thing to, to talk about and thing but you have to wonder when I, when I started out in category theory uh, not category theory, in look getting an understanding of category theory and you look at the axioms for a, the rules for a category and a function you have to you have to ask yourself why do they choose these now this is a particularly important question now, for a mathematician, it's, it's natural because really the category theory is, is abstracting all the goodies, all the best parts of algebra and geometry and, and so on and so forth. And so for them, it's quite natural. Yeah, they're, you know, it's talking about uh, linear algebra, you know, vectors and maps. It's quite natural. You know, the, the progression is quite natural. It's almost just a, a name change, but a little bit more than that, obviously more than that, of course. But if, you come, if you're an outsider like me and you come in, you, go, you say, why? You know, if, particularly from a computer science like me, I, I could have programmed this anyway. Why did you choose that particular combination? And this is very important in cognitive science because we call it, you know, some philosophers get go way off on this notion of um, um, sort of this so-called symbol grounding problem and, and mathematics is just nothing but um, a game playing of symbols. But that's not, when you look at it, then you start to realize, ah, why did, why just this particular set of things can link up to so much of mathematics? And it starts to suggest to me um, that really it's capturing something deep if not about the, the world that we live in, about the way we think about the world that we live in. I mean, that's, that's why I found it's probably the most extraordinary thing. Otherwise, it's just a pure chance. If you had just said, I could create a bunch of rules, uh, it's just one in a billion chance that you get just these rules. I mean, there are many ways to, but you know, obviously, and if you read McLean, and McLean has another very nice book called Form and Function, where he looks at the motivations for uh, mathematics and then, hey, from that, and you know, it, it just comes from basic psychological processes like counting and uh, comparison and, and things. You know, it's really an abstraction of these very, very basic 
things. But how, but what's extraordinary is, you know, how these ideas converge. You know, some of these ideas, you know, McLean and Ireland, even though McLean never had this notion of adjunct. I mean, the specific cases were already in mathematics, but, you know, extraordinarily, you know, two extremely clever mathematicians, when they invented their, developed their theory in 45, it wasn't until 10 years later that someone else came or Khan came along and said, oh, look, we have this very general notion. And once that happened, boom, the field really took off. It's just extraordinary. I mean, <laughs> there's no two ways about it. If you really want to get, if you really want to see something beautiful, you've got to, uh, to appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I, I struggle for, you know, sometimes years on some of these concepts and then bang, then you finally realize how stupid you were. And then you saw the, saw the, the view from another view, uh, the, saw the idea from another viewpoint. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, so, so to finally answer, sorry, that's a, that's a very long detour to answer. Um, at this stage, no, I'm thinking, I, I don't have a particular, yeah, yeah. yeah, at this stage. But I'm really interested in adjoints now. I mean, I think it, it depends on the context, of course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for example, the um, developmental uh, study, mm -hmm. uh, I think it is very important to focus on the adjunction, mm -hmm. kind of dialogue mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. structure of our cognition and the make, making of conscience. Mm -hmm. So, a kind of dialogue ontology, for mm -hmm. example, is very fit uh, to the notion of adjunction because. We um, in carbon theory, uh, everything and all, every object that can be characterized um, from the branch of relation uh, to other under uh, itself, so all the uh, objects. Like that, we can consider the category itself is a meta level object, and how to characterize the personality of the category. Then the very important uh, thing is uh, it is used uh, as an so essential structure of the category is nothing but the uh, uh, existence of the other categories. Uh, between other categories, there is some adjunction or sometimes in, uh, the relation between something as self to the self, itself, uh, the relation to me or something. So these kind of uh, structure is very, how to say, um, surprising um, without the category theoretical mathematics, the, our philosophy is very, very narrow mm -hmm. or the very um, vague, uh, sorry for the CDR, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, like Pusa or uh, uh, or maybe great philosophers pointed out uh, the very, how to say, um, ambitiously uh, using maybe the natural language, but uh, by using the category theory, I believe, and uh, she also did that we can clarify and uh, open up the new philosophy of it. Uh, there is no uh, such a tool, I, as far as I know, in the uh, excessive European culture. Yeah, Western culture. So I think that in that sense, also the category is very important. I, I actually also was thinking in, in relation to your question, I, I thought it would be probably adjunction mm -hmm. would be the most important thing for the consciousness research mm -hmm. um, in this case, but also from the developmental perspective yeah, as yeah. well, but also the dynamics as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we, we have some roboticism here, so I'll just talk a little bit about it. But that, you know, that you usually, mm. I, I want to also point out one thing. So, you, when we talk a, 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 a lot about, you know, Leonardo Dilemma, like the you know, Marcos, you know uh, color, uh, you know, characterization are my way of, you know, uh, pointing out the two, want, um, mm. characterize this with the other relationship. Mm. This feels like a bit static, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's so, um, so-called a program of the structuralism. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 60s or 70s or 80s, uh, when uh, many people actually got excited about this kind of idea, like, you know, rather than trying to characterize thing as it is uh, through the structure, we can understand much better. Like uh, uh, Levi uh, Strauss and things like that uh, pr uh, proposed this and then found some interesting thing. However, their idea was mostly static, right? 
but why by having this kind of you know a junction coming back but it's now slightly you know deviated that kind of reminds you of uh, dynamics right by interacting with the uh, yeah. other person the environment you actually come back but a bit different person so th this is a dynamics and also development and so learning right yeah that's yeah. what you wanted to say yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the um so if, for example, there's some subject and the environment or internal or the other thing, um, some, maybe there is some adjunction. But uh, this is uh, adjunct functor is a functor. So you can compose the uh, functor. So we have some loop. This is actually the dynamics of this, this, and also this. Mm -hmm. So um, very interestingly, adjunction uh, th this is called a junction, and this loop, the very good functor, is called uh, monad. Uh, so mm -hmm. a junction gives monad, and monad gives a junction. This, this uh, view is quite interesting finding that, uh, of course, more uh, precisely, the, the monad uh, gives a many kinds of a junction. So a, a junction has a more detailed a structure uh, in, in a sense, but uh, uh, actually um, what we uh, want to stress is that I think that, for example, that in the development studies of something, there is a too extreme view of the um, um, development. Mm -hmm. some, some people stress on the uh, autonomy, autonomy, autonomous, so the child, himself uh, herself with themselves but uh, some people stress on the interaction between environment but but from the category theoretical philosophy uh, this is uh, not the case uh, it is the same thing a uh, kind so I think this uh, change of view uh, based on our uh, inspired by the is a very important and very beautiful uh, finding and uh, my uh, ex supervisor of uh, physics, uh, Ojima, uh, is uh, stressed on this importance of this structure in the context of micro macro duality, which is a quantum and the classical mm -hmm. uh, relations. As, uh, and also, uh, he wants to stress uh, some dynamical nature of the uh, so microscopic and macroscopic dynamics. Is there any question or comment? Or is it pretty rare <laughs> chance to ask this kind of thing? <laughs> or any any kind of part that was not so clear? I think it would be really great if you guys can start thinking about the language or development uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, discussion session, um, especially thinking about a junction like mm -hmm. that. Maybe it's too difficult, I don't know. It may take some time to get used to. I mean, just a, a very simple observation is, as, as you all know, you know, the brain itself is composed of many reciprocal, reci reciprocating connections. So or, already you have almost the, yeah. it's crying out for mm -hmm. some sort of, analysis there in that sense but i mean it, it i mean it's just just a, the, the nice thing about category three it really suggests a lot of things that you would not normally consider but the suggestion is one thing you know whether it actually uh, leads you somewhere to something else of course there's a lot of hard work in in, in getting that so i, I don't want to i don't want to say it's all ham i just want, yeah please don't say it. It, it, category three will solve every problem of course you know some st structures are just not categories so Automatically, you just rule it. But having said that, it's often straightforward to just talk a collection of those structures that that make a category. Yeah. And the other interesting thing is about why. Actually, someone asked this when I, I gave the uh, tutorial co at Cogside this year on category theory, and someone asked one of the other speakers, um, uh, "Why not? We, why not we just categories look very much like graphs? So why not just use graph theory?" 
And again, I'll, I'll another <laughs> shameless plug from my paper. If you if you really go through the details, there are only two crucial axioms for a category, and that is the identity and associativity axiom. Oh, the fact that um, every um, arrow, when you compose end to end, must have another arrow. Now, this is some additional structure. It gets back to my previous point. We don't want the most general generalization. If we just want a generalization. We wouldn't even use categories. We just use graphs. Categories, graphs even more. But they're not really that, they don't have enough structure to be interesting. And you, crucially, you need identities. You, you, the identity arrow, identity arrow is just an arrow that goes back on itself. Okay. And sometimes it's called the do nothing. But actually, that sells it short. Identity arrow is crucial. In fact, you don't even get the unit element without the identity arrows. Now, you know, it just seems why something so trivial, apparently so trivial, could be so crucial. And it's a bit like an, the, the analog to in, in group theory, uh, the introduction of the number zero. Zero is not really nothing. And so there's a distinction between nothing. It's a number, even though it, it often acts like nothing. And the same with the identity arrows. So the identity arrow and the, um, the fact that all the arrows, they're really only just you know, those two. And you know, from that, you get a lot of stuff. It's just incredible. The reason why you do it, of course, is because underlying these, these little arrows, these diagrams, is a whole lot of algebra. Okay, and that's where the power comes in, this combination of geometry and algebra. Um, if I just from this conceptual, this sort of hand wavy introduction that I gave, but you know, looks like you, you know, where's the real action? Well, you know, underlying all this, you know, these f's and x's and the arrows are really doing something. In graphs, I could be just label arrows and just paths, and that's it. That's why the graphs are a little bit too general; they don't really do anything. In category theory, you know, these things actually do, you know, like functions and, so, and relations and so on and so forth. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to say that category theory is all mighty or powerful. Um, but and but um, you know you still got to do a lot of work to to see whether it, but it does suggest a lot of things. It wouldn't, as Heiter already said, you know, a philosophy that you would not normally think about. You know, you know, before I started, the reason why I got into category theory is I was really, you know, the the way that people, we were doing cognitive science wasn't really ins inspirational to me. It's very much the same way we were doing it ten years. You know, uh, and category theory really opened my eyes to a whole world of possibilities. It doesn't, yeah. I just want to say that. it's not a magic wand by any means, but yeah. so after this, uh, we were supposed to give an uh, introduction to the explanation of discussion topics, but uh, it seems like there are not much things to say. So we'll go relatively quickly after the break, and then after this, what for it is. And then supposed to be the break until uh, post session was supposed to start uh, from 5.30, but maybe Let's take a uh, 10 minute break um, and then uh, start from uh, 5.20. Uh, we'll do the uh, ready of the discussion topic. And then uh, following that, we'll go to the post hours. Okay, so 30 minutes break. Thank you. Thank you.